Hello, listeners. It's new episode time. Yay! That's a huge audience. Millions of people all applauding at the same time. Just a huge crowd of people who have been waiting outside my apartment. Just, we want a new episode, new episode. And there I'm, I appear at the window and announcing a new episode. And then the crowd just goes like that. Anyway, new episode time. So just before we start, I need to get a message to listeners who are subscribed to Luke's English Podcast Premium through Libsyn. That's the old system. Now, you've heard me say in recent announcements that the podcast has moved to a new host, that's Acast, and that people who were already subscribed to the premium subscription with the old system... Libsyn would have to cancel, get a refund from Libsyn, and then sign up with Acast. But I need to ask you to wait before doing that. Okay, so just wait. Hold on. Hold your horses. Basically, Libsyn premium subscribers, please wait before you cancel and move to the new system. Okay, now some of you are saying, but Luke, I've already, I've already done it. That's all right. That's okay. It's all right. The thing is, there's been a slight problem, just a, a hiccup with the process of moving LEP Premium from Libsyn to Acast. I'm working on a solution right now. Everything will be okay, but Libsyn Premium subscribers, please wait before cancelling your old Premium subscription and moving to Acast Plus. Libsyn have basically said to me, Luke, tell your listeners to stop asking for refunds. Just hold on. So I'm, I'm asking you to stop asking for refunds from Libsyn. Just wait. I will give you instructions as soon as possible about what to do. I'll record an announcement and publish it, and I will send you an email. I'll put something on the website. Somehow I'll get the message across to you. When the time is right, I'll let you know the next step. Okay? So, yeah, some of you have already sent emails to Libsyn, and they told you to email me. Again, just wait. I'm working on a solution. I'll give you more instructions as soon as possible. Now, if you're not already a premium subscriber, if you're new to Luke's English Podcast Premium, then you might want to know that Luke's English Podcast Premium is now available on Acast Plus. That's my premium subscription. If you want to get access to over a hundred lessons from me about grammar, vocabulary, and pronunciation with PDFs to download, Go to teacherluke.co.uk slash premium and choose the LEP premium option. Okay, so that's if you're new to it. It's available. You can get it in any normal podcasting app and you can listen to the episodes and get the PDFs. Nice one. If you want to know more, if, for example, if you signed up with Acast Plus and there is something you don't understand, just send me an email, luketeacher at hotmail.com or go to... Um, teacherluke.co.uk slash premium info. Right, so thanks for listening to that announcement. Now here's a Rick Thompson report for you to enjoy, recorded on Monday the 11th of July 2022. That's that's uh, that's yesterday. Um, I've, now I have to do a quick introduction to this episode just to help out the people listening to this who have no idea what's going on. I mean, not generally, I mean not just people who are just like, oh, what's going on? What, where am I? Who am I? Not those people, but I mean people who, who have no idea of what's going on in UK politics. So a five-minute introduction, I guess, and then you'll get your fill of Rick Thompson on Luke's English podcast. Okay, right. Here's the jingle. You're listening to Luke's English podcast. For more information, visit teacherluke.co.uk. So, hello listeners. Yes, this is episode 777, 777. And it's a new episode of the Rick Thompson Report. Just in case you don't know, the Rick Thompson Report episodes are when I talk to my dad, Rick Thompson, about what's been going on in the news, especially UK news, that's British news, and especially UK politics. My dad is a semi-retired journalist a broadcasting consultant and a writer. And we're very lucky to have him as a guest on this podcast. If you've seen any news from the UK recently, you will have seen that it's all been about Boris Johnson for a change. 
Boris Johnson is the current Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. Yes, the one with the funny, scruffy blonde hair, the badly fitting suits, and the look on his face, which makes him look like a schoolboy who's done something wrong. Boris Johnson, our current Prime Minister, the leader of the Conservative Party and the head of the UK government. Now, some of you are saying this, you're thinking, but wait a minute, Luke, he's not the current Prime Minister. Didn't he resign on Friday? Didn't he step down? Well, yes, He did make a speech on Friday, the 8th of July, in which he said the process to find a new leader of the Conservative Party and Prime Minister of the UK should begin now. So he basically said the UK should begin the process of finding a new Prime Minister now. So it it looked like he resigned on Friday. He basically said he would resign when the new leader has been chosen, although he didn't actually say the word resign in his speech or the word sorry, or anything like that, no. So he is still the Prime Minister, and he will be until the new one is chosen, which will probably happen in September. So what's going on? Why did he essentially say that he would step down or resign uh, later this year? Uh, What did he do wrong this time? What are the events that have led up to this situation? What might happen next And what do we really think of Boris Johnson? That's what we're going to try and deal with in this conversation. I hope you can follow this. It's all a bit complicated. To be honest, while my dad was talking during this conversation, while we were recording this yesterday, as an English teacher, alarms were going off in my head. Like, "Ah, ah, ah," alarms were going off in my head. I mean, I kept thinking, oh God, oh God, we're really, we're going through a lot of quite specific and complex language here at a fast pace and we're not really stopping to clarify things in the way that I know as a teacher that my learners often need. My English teacher brain was panicking. Maybe I maybe I could have interrupted the conversation at various points and added in some explanations, but you know what? That just wasn't possible this time. Also, my dad was in full flow here, so I decided to just let him go, to just let him rip. So, as is often the case, I'm just throwing you in at the deep end and playing the conversation for you. Hopefully, you're curious enough about this situation and that listening to my dad is enjoyable enough and that you feel motivated to stay focused and keep listening, that my dad's English is clear enough. If you can do that, if you can stick with this and stay interested and listen all the way through, this will definitely help your English. Perhaps I can make a premium episode explaining a lot of the language in this conversation, but that might be difficult because I don't have very much time available to me at the moment because I'm doing lots and lots of teaching and dealing with the whole Libsyn Acast situation and other things. Um, I mean, I might be able to put some words and phrases from the conversation on the website page for this, and then you would be able to check them uh, to see how they're spelled and things like that. But I can't promise anything because, like, even this introduction, which is going on for too long now, even this, I'm recording this at eleven uh, thirty-five. Um, it's bedtime. It's time for me to go to bed. But no, I'm recording this because I need to get it published as soon as possible because these Rick Thompson report episodes about politics need to go out immediately as soon as they've been recorded. So anyway, a lot of our conversation focuses on why Boris is resigning. And that means describing his personality, describing things he's done both as prime minister and before, describing the scandals he's been involved in and describing the way the UK government works or doesn't work. Um, in this case, maybe, and how leaders are chosen in the UK. Watch out for language relating to those things, as well as little idiomatic phrases and so on. But generally, I hope you can really just get into this subject and try to find out a thing or two about Boris Johnson that you weren't aware of before. He's not just a funny looking politician with a sense of humour. There's more going on than that. I'll talk to you again briefly at the end of this. But now, let's get started. This is the Rick Thompson Report with Rick Thompson. Probably the best way for me to start this episode is just to say to you, okay, Dad, Boris Johnson, go. 
<laughs> oh dear. Well, things, things are moving here very quickly. So, you know, by the time you post this online, who knows what will have changed? But um, the situation is at the moment that he is. Uh, he said he will resign, and the Conservative Party, the governing Conservative Party, are now in a leadership contest to see who will replace him. Um, they have some very arcane rules, which I don't really agree with. Uh, which means it's the Conservative Party who choose who their next leader is, and then hit that person becomes the Prime Minister. So a lot of people in the country would like to be able to vote for who they think would be the Prime Minister, rather than allow it the, the Tory party, as it's known, the Tory party faithful doing it. But that's what's happening. What happened in the days before Friday the 8th of July was quite interesting and sort of unprecedented. Lots of MPs resigned in protest at Boris Johnson as the leader of the Conservative Party and the Prime Minister. And then on Friday, he made a speech in front of Downing Street and appeared to resign as Prime Minister. OK, so what, what's happened then, Dad? Can you try and explain oh to us what's, what's <laughs> been try. going on? I'll certainly try. Um, well, it, it's been a roller coaster ride ever since he became Prime Minister three years ago. Now, regular listeners to uh, this podcast will know that I am no fan of Boris Johnson. And I've said he's totally inappropriate leader for a long time. And his record, as far as I'm concerned, is pretty terrible. Um, but he does have a following, uh, certainly in the Conservative Party. He has a strong popular following. Um, he he got he, he he finally had to go because, as you say, lots of ministers, senior ministers, members of the cabinet, as well as junior ministers, were resigning en masse, demanding that he go. And in the end, um, after many attempts to persuade them that they should keep him, uh, he had to bow to the inevitable. Mm. So, as you say, on Friday, he announced that he he didn't use the word resign, which is quite interesting. Yeah. And, of course, he may be back w one day. Who knows? Other people who have been big personalities and controversial leaders have gone and come back, like Berlusconi in Italy and... Um, and Trump keeps saying he's not finished and, and so on. But at the moment, uh, yes, he's uh, he said he'll step down, and but he'll stay in Downing Street until there is a new leader selected. Mm -hmm. So he's kind of camped in Downing Street in an acting capacity, which is, you know, it's kind of a lame duck government. They, they're not doing anything much while this leadership contest goes on. Uh, yes, it's Monday and, and this evening... The Conservative uh, parliamentary uh, members, the backbenchers, who have a committee, are going to meet and they'll probably decide on the rules for this and they might change the rules a bit because uh, they want to accelerate the process. And there are 11 people who've said they want to be leader so far, 11 candidates uh, all of them campaigning madly and saying how wonderful they'd be and saying how many MPs they've got supporting them. So that's an awful lot of people. So the parliamentary party will no doubt cut that number down and then there will be a voting process amongst the MPs. So just the Conservative MPs, is that right? Just That's the right. It's in two stages. The first stage is that the Conservative MPs choose... The final two, this is the present rules, and I think it probably will be the final two. And then the final two go out to all the party members in the country. And there are between 100 and 200,000, I think it's near 100,000 members of the Conservative Party uh, all across the country. And they have the chance to vote on which of these two they choose. OK, just a bit of detail. In the UK, of course, we don't have a presidential system. We have a prime ministerial system, which means that when uh, there is an election, a general election, uh, people all around the country vote for members of parliament. And each member of parliament represents one constituency or one small area of the country. And each consist constituency represents a seat in the House of Commons. So the party that gets the, the majority of the seats in the Commons has the right to form a government. So basically, when people vote in an election, they don't vote for the leader. They don't vote for a person. They vote for the party. 
essentially. They vote in a party. They they give a party power. That's right. right? The, the party which gains the most seats is invited by the head of state, the Queen, to form a government. And the party leader at the time becomes the prime minister. And right. That's what happens. But it's a very good point you're making because Johnson keeps on, has been saying he's had a mandate from the last election that, you know, he claims that it was all because of him that they had such a huge majority. I mean, there's a certain element of truth in it, but he's acting like a president and has perpetually tried to bypass the parliamentary party, the House of Commons, and operate like a in a presidential way this has not gone down well with the uh, with the MPs and even in his speech on Friday he talked about them acting like a herd uh, which you know is, is fairly insulting for the elected representatives so I don't think he's actually endeared himself to the House of Commons and um, all this stuff about he is the person who won the election. Um, is not actually true. A lot of candidates won their seats. It's typical Boris Johnson, isn't it, really? Because yes. he, this is what he's like. He's completely self-interested and self-serving and only thinks of himself. That's a very, 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 very tough comment, to Luke, about our private It's a personal attack, but, I mean, <laughs> you know, many people are saying the same thing. And, it, you know, people who... It's hard, obviously, to uh, profile someone psychologically from a distance in this way but um looking at behavior over the years and people who are close to him who've known him very well have said the same thing that he's very self uh, oriented and self-serving that's absolutely true and a lot of people who've worked closely with him uh, have been saying not just now but uh, in in the last two or three years how unsuitable he is to be the leader he doesn't have any morality in political terms doesn't have any real vision um doesn't mm -hmm. they don't know what he stands for and all all these things are borne out by the facts that uh, he has been at least erratic but also very self-serving as prime minister over the last three years i mean it, it's no secret that i think he's been the worst prime minister uh, certainly in living memory I mean, I think he's been terrible. But uh, the the party have finally turned against him because of a whole succession of specific things, which, uh, I mean, I can tell you about a few of them, if you like. Yes, please. Well, three years ago, they had a general election when he became the prime minister, two, 2019. And he won a massive great majority for the Conservative Party. They had a clear 80 seats majority, yeah. which is, uh, you know... Uh, equivalent to when Tony Blair swept to power uh, a few years before, a big majority. And um, the problem was, of course, he thought he could do anything he liked at that point and, and um, he wouldn't have any internal opposition. So how come somebody who everybody knows, uh, he's a figure known around the world, he's quite a charismatic speaker, he's unusual, uh, he's quite exotic. Got funny hair. Funny hair. And... Um, you know, how come uh, they've thrown him out when he's won this great majority and, and so on? Well, it's been a whole succession of things. He's been fired for dishonesty many a time. He started his career uh, as a... Oh, well, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll, I'll read you briefly his school report. OK. All right. He, he, went, he went to Eton, of course, the top public school or private school where I think at the late last count, uh, annual fees are £48,000. Yeah, I mean, basically, Eton, yeah, it's... It's, uh, it's Eton. It, it, it's called a public school, uh, although that's a strange name because it's not public, it's like very private, and it's the school that all the children of the most powerful people in the, in the country go to, and it's the uh, training ground for members of the establishment, and it's extremely... That's right. It's extremely... Um, Exclusive and where all the privileged people go. Well, they've obviously got to be rich for starters yeah. to go there. And, and it is seen as a kind of training ground for people who are going to be the leaders. And I think it probably infects their brains that they all think that they're, that they're naturally going to take control, become going to politics. You yeah, know, but that's, that I mean, that's, that's the purpose of the school. It's to basically uh, train people to run the country. And so it makes yes. them feel like they have an entitlement to basically just run the show. <laughs> Very much against it, but I just thought you'd be amused to hear what his when he was age seventeen, his uh, his uh, senior teacher did his 
school report, and it said, Boris has adopted a disgracefully cavalier attitude to his studies. Disgracefully cavalier, reckless. Attitude. Very yes. reckless attitude to his studies. So careless yeah. and reckless, yeah. Correct. He sometimes seems affronted when criticised for what amounts to a gross failure of responsibility. So, OK, so if he's done something wrong where he's in a position of responsibility, like, for example, being the captain of the... Like, what's an example of a, of a position of responsibility he might have been in? He could have been head of his house or whatever, but in fact he wasn't. But uh, he says he didn't, wouldn't take responsibility and seemed to, seemed to get offended if anyone criticised him for being irresponsible. And he goes on to say he seemed surprised that he was not appointed captain of the school. And it goes on, I think he honestly believes that it is churlish of us not to regard him as an exception, one who should be free of the network of obligation that binds everybody else. So that was what he was like at the age of 17. He had no responsibility and he seemed that he was an exception and shouldn't be, you know, have the obligation to do things the way everybody else has to do them. Rules don't apply to him. You might say, oh, well, that was a long time ago. He was only a teenager, blank thing. But, it, but there's a pattern. He went off to start his career in journalism at the Times newspaper and was sacked within a year for making up quotes um, for his articles notably one about King Edward II. Quotes, this is when you say what someone else has said and you put it in quotation marks, and he just made up some quotes. And then not only did he invent them, he invented them badly too, because he <laughs> yes. said that uh, some figures from history had spent time in a certain place, but that place hadn't even been built at that period. He was fabricating articles. Mm -hmm. um, and um, when he got into government, he became um, a Conservative Party vice chairman. And um, he was fired from that job because he told the leader of the party that he was not having a, an extramarital affair with a journalist. Mm -hmm. But when it emerged that he was, and he blatantly lied to the chairman of the party that he hadn't, he was fired from that job. So just to um, say that the journalist he was sleeping with, the girl that he'd been having an affair with, the woman Petronella girl... Petronella Wyatt, yes. She, she, he'd been lying to her too because he promised that he would marry her. He didn't. Yeah, he got right. her pregnant. She ended up having an abortion. So you might call this a colourful background, but I mean, it's pretty disreputable. Then when we came to the crucial year of Brexit, 2016, when the referendum happened, David Cameron was the Prime Minister, and um, he was rather relying on Boris Johnson to uh, campaign for us to remain in the EU. Now, I think that was a fairly logical thing to believe because Boris Johnson had become Mayor of London, and, and in that time he'd spoken warmly about the benefits of being in the EU and how important it was, how important it was for the city and all that kind of thing. And when it came to the referendum campaign, he obviously calculated that opinion polls were quite close and he reckoned that if he joined the Brexit campaign, leave the EU, he might have a shot at becoming the Prime Minister because Cameron would have to go if he lost the referendum. And that's exactly what happened. At the very last minute, Boris told Cameron he was going to campaign for Brexit, not too much to Cameron's surprise. And he did so with great enthusiasm and by uh, employing what you might call dubious tactics uh, by all sorts of extravagant claims about how evil the EU was and how much money we wasted on the EU. And he even went around the country with his boosterish, positive style saying that we send 250 million pounds a year. 350. Sorry, 350 million pounds a year to the EU, and we could spend that money on the health service. And that's what it said on the side of his bus. Yeah, the famous um, both, bus. Both these things are wrong. Um, the 350 million pounds took no account whatsoever, all the money that comes back from the EU in various grants. So the net figure was much smaller. And, of course, the prospect of pouring that money into the NHS was um, never, 
a, a practical one. NHS, but it listeners. did, but it did well. But it did well. NHS, NHS yeah. is the health service. So yeah, he pro- he said to everyone, and he rode round the country on in a big red bus with these words written in big letters on the side of the bus. Um, Let's stop sending three hundred and fifty million pounds to the EU. We'll That's put right. It, we'll spend it on the NHS, the National Health Service, instead. Which is you know sickening because yeah, first of all, it wasn't three hundred and fifty million, and secondly, the chances of them actually giving that money to the NHS was small anyway because the Conservatives uh, again have been criticised many times over the years for undermining the NHS and not Indeed. investing in the NHS that's like one of their signature uh, moves isn't it the, the Tories yes. it's part of their, their belief that private is better than public that you, you privatise things and then you get more efficiency and that's a kind of conservative belief so what happened was that um, uh, you know the the uh, Brexit referendum was very narrowly won by the Leave campaign and David Cameron promptly resigned. And it was a very divisive move because it split the country in many ways, not just almost 50-50 in, in those who voted, but Scotland voted to remain, Northern Ireland voted to remain, London voted to remain, the rest of the country didn't. So there we were. And and after a, a bit of wrangling over who should replace David Cameron, Theresa May emerged as the leader. Now, obviously, there was Boris Johnson, populist uh, guy who would led this campaign, by the way, almost certainly funded by Russian money, Mm-hmm. Uh, which is quite interesting because the only person celebrating us leaving the EU was probably Putin. And Theresa May um, appointed him as foreign secretary. Uh, rather, people surprised. Foreign secretary is the person responsible for... Um, He's foreign affairs. He's the minister for foreign affairs. Minister for foreign affairs. Okay. One of the biggest figures in the, in the government. Representing uh, Britain's interests abroad and also the sort of uh, overseer of the secret services as well. Yeah. So he lasted for a while, a couple of years, but resigned from that post just before he was fired. Uh, It was a litany of, I quote somebody, a litany of blunders and diplomatic insults when he was the foreign secretary. Uh, He failed to turn up for meetings. He made a a number of crucial errors, notably a woman called Nazanin Zahari Ratcliffe uh, was held in custody in Iran. She has dual citizenship, British and Iranian. She was visiting around to visit her family, and they arrested her and accused her of spying. Well, she was just on holiday. Boris Johnson, in the House of Commons, said, uh, you know, she, she was only, only uh, teaching journalists. Now, you might think that's an innocent fact, but in Iran, this is not a good idea. And, and they said, they are. They are. She said she was on holiday, but she wasn't. And uh, he made sure she stayed there for five years before she finally got out. So he casually said that she was teaching journalists. I mean, did, was there any grounds for him saying that? Um, I don't think so. And that directly put her life in danger. Well, she was separated from her family, from her little daughter. Uh, and um, it took a long, long time before she came out. And it was linked with a, a debt that Britain owed Iran going back to the Shah's time, we owed them £400 million. And uh, in, even though both sides said there was no connection between these things, in the end, we paid the money and she came home. So uh, you can draw your own conclusions. There were a whole number of things. The, the, the one that as- astonishes me, and they're still talking about it, still investigating it even now, was uh, in 2018 when he was the Foreign Secretary He went on a a trip to Italy directly from a NATO meeting. He'd been at a NATO meeting and then got on an easy jet plane and went off to the castle of a guy called Evgeny Lebedev, who owned a couple of newspapers in this country, a Russian-born man. And Lebedev uh, had a habit of throwing exotic parties, and so he went to this party in Lebedev's castle, where apparently there were girls, there were models, there was an awful lot of drink. He didn't take any security people with him, he didn't take any aides with him, he went entirely on his own, and people wouldn't have known had he not been photographed at the airport in Italy, uh, obviously wearing, he'd slept in his clothes, and he looked terrible, couldn't walk in a straight line, and told people that he'd had a heavy night. Now, 
uh, for for your foreign secretary to behave like that is absolutely beyond belief. And not only that he went off to a, a, a boozy party in Italy in a castle, but it was being organised by uh, this newspaper guy, Lebedev, who is the son of a former KGB agent who was very close to Putin. And uh, you, you wonder about his judgment, apart from anything else. Uh, not only that, uh, later on, when he was making um, uh, some of some people go to the House of Lords, that's what a prime minister can do. You recommend that people can become a lord and go to the upper chamber, uh, the House of Lords. In the House of Lords, they get to vote on on laws, and they directly yeah, they do. It's like the Senate, only it's not elected. Okay. It's, uh, it's you know, done another way. Very strange. And the security services apparently warned Johnson about uh, elevating Lebedev to this. They thought it would be a security risk. He ignored them, and he made uh, he made him a lord. This is this is um, just one example of the way Johnson not only shocked everybody, but was also above the rules and and didn't care. And his people close to him said he, you know, he, he couldn't be bothered to read his papers. It was too much effort uh, and so on and so on. So, I mean, there's many other instances. But nonetheless, when uh, Brexit was getting more and more difficult and Theresa May couldn't persuade the House of Commons to support her version of Brexit, in the end, she resigned and Johnson became leader, and that was in 2019. Why did he become leader? Because the party, remember, it's they who select who it will be, the party believe he wins elections. He's a winner. Mm -hmm. People know him. They quite like him. He's been on the telly a lot, been on the TV a lot, a bit like Donald Trump. Donald Trump had his own programme, The Apprentice. Uh, Boris Johnson was a regular on a BBC uh, One satire show, uh, which was amusing, topical programme. And, and he, he became very well known and, and people liked him because he was a bit of a character and he was quite witty and you never knew what he was going to say next. And, of course, um, you know, being well known and being quite a likable rogue uh, was enough to say he could he could become mayor of london and he could become prime minister he could win elections so they they chose him because of his campaigning skills and his ability to make a funny speech and uh, and sure enough eventually there was an election at the end of 2019 when he campaigned to get Brexit done. Three-word slogans. Three-word slogans, you know, like uh, take back control during the uh, referendum on Brexit. Mm -hmm. Three-word slogans, it worked. People were tired of Brexit. They thought he'd just get it done. Even though he promised to get it done by the end of October, it wasn't done by the end of October. And in the end, it was the end of January the following year. And in my mind, it hasn't been done yet because there are lots of outstanding issues yeah. uh, that are still being talked about and are still unresolved. So not only did he say he would get Brexit done, he got elected on that promise, and it hasn't actually happened yet properly. <laughs> so, I mean, he's an amazing character, uh, and he still has his following. But it's smaller than it was, surely. I mean, all those MPs that resigned, there's only a little gang of, let's call them weirdos, that support him. I'm calling them weirdos because... I think they are. He's got a, he's got a, some support in the House of Commons, but he's got more support in the conservative faithful out across the country. Right. Um, you know, the you know and and these are the members of the party, so they're kind of dedicated conservatives. And a lot of these people say, "Oh, I like Boris. He's been, you know, he's been badly used. He's a winner and all that kind of thing." Well, the argument that Boris is a winner evaporated recently when there were two by-elections. Now, the, the, by, <laughs> what's a by-election? How can I explain this? A by-election is when an MP is no longer sitting for their constituency. They either die or they resign for one reason or another. And so there's no MP. And so they have a mini-election just in that constituency. To replace that's that. A, that's called a by-election. To replace that yeah. MP. 
And yeah. it, it's not just to replace the MP with someone else from the same party, but it's a little mini election that uh, oh, any, absolutely. any MP from any other party could be elected for that seat. And they're quite interesting by elections because they are a way of taking the temperature of what the public mood is at that particular time. The reason there were two by elections quite recently was for another problem the Conservative Party have got under his leadership. Mm -hmm. And this is known as sleaze. Sleaze. Difficult word. It's a bit of a political word here, sleaze, but it means wrongdoing of one kind or another. And it's just a little worse than that sleaze that's the word Im immoral behavior of one kind yes. or another doing something wrong and it's often it often involves corruption or sexual things yes it does uh, one of the mps violated one of the strongest rules in, in westminster which is you don't use your position for personal gain by lobbying on behalf of big business Yes, yeah. you're there to represent the interests of your constituents. One of them, a guy called Owen Patterson, was taking more than a hundred thousand pounds a year from two big companies, and it was shown that he was lobbying on their behalf, trying to get government contracts for them, holding meetings with them in the house, which is again against the rules, uh, nine nine times, and um, when it was exposed, um, the uh, the relevant committee in the House suspended him at least for 30 days while they'd made more inquiries. And Boris Johnson refused to accept that because he was a loyal supporter of Boris Johnson. And his move was to say, I think, um, I think we don't need this ethics committee. I think we'll, we'll just get rid of the committee, which is so uh, extraordinary that he was forced by public opinion, really, to do a U-turn as we say when we're driving a car, go the other way around. Go the other direction. And they had to had to ask Patterson to resign completely. And Patterson was so disgraced that he he did. So he left. He was no longer an MP. Similar time, there was an MP who got conviction for sexually assaulting a young man. He resigned. There was also um, an occasion when um, another MP was found watching pornography on his phone in the House of Commons chamber. Now, th these are all Conservative MPs, right? They're all Conservative MPs. Now, he hasn't resigned as an MP. He's only been chucked out of the Conservative Party, but he's refused to resign, so he's still there This one guy, independent. he was found looking at pornography in the House of Commons chamber, like literally in the chamber yeah. where they all sit and debate things. I know, it's always beyond belief, isn't it? He was looking at porn on his phone in, as, in there. As, as some of the women MPs said, you know, we could see him doing it. He claimed he was uh, he was lo looking for a type of tractor for his farm, and and and, uh, and the porn came up by mistake because the right. name of the tractor was similar or something. But the what's the, the name MP of the tractor? Said, I don't know. But the women MP said, "No, no, no. We've seen him do it on several occasions." So uh, another liar. Oh my god. Um, so there were two MPs who had resigned from the House of Commons, so two were by-elections in very different areas. One of them was down in the West Country, a place called Tiverton, mm -hmm. and the other one was up in Yorkshire in the north of England. And uh, the Conservative candidate uh, seat in Tiverton in Devon... In Devon, yeah. ...had been solidly Conservative for years. And the guy who resigned left with a massive majority. I think it was 23,000 vote majority over the next next person. Wow. Huge majority. The Wakefield one was one of the seats that the Tories had won in the big landslide, uh, you know, and it was traditionally a Labour area, but it had gone Conservative, like a lot of the seats in North did. So they were very different seats. What happened was that uh, the Liberal Democrats took Tiverton with a significant majority. They wiped out this massive majority and took Tiverton. It's a big swing away from the Conservatives. And there was a big swing towards Labour in, in Wakefield, and they, they took the seat in the North. Both these were really, really bad results for the Conservatives. So Boris as a winner suddenly looked like Boris as a loser, He's a liability, not an asset. And that's 
obviously one of the main reasons in the end they turned against him. I think there was a last straw. Do you want to explain what the last straw is? Yeah, so that's this is the key phrase, really, to explain why Boris resigned or why he was pushed out um, or why he's being pushed out because he still isn't out yet. But the last straw, so this is the last straw. So um, I should say it's that... A, it's a fable. It's a fable yeah. about a camel. Yeah, the last straw that breaks the camel's back. So it's a common expression, this is the last straw. It just means the one little thing which um, is the accumulation of lots of other things which ultimately uh, changes the situation. It's the last straw that breaks the camel's back. So you've got your camel, you've got lots of stuff loaded on the the back of the camel, uh, a lot of things, uh, lots of things are packed on. You think, oh, is the camel going to make it? Is its back going to break? And it's okay up until the point you put one final little piece of straw on the top and bang the the camel the camel's back breaks so it's the last straw that's exactly what it is so i'm just going to tell you in a minute about what the last straw was which made all these um conservative ministers resign um before the last straw i haven't mentioned party gate mm-hmm. and this was very very damaging to Boris Johnson, very damaging. During the pandemic, he was doing um, TV appearances in a specially built press conference room, telling everybody they had to stay at home and they had to do this and they had to do that. And for a while, it was uh, it was very severe. It may well have been the same in other countries. It was it was it, it was another slogan: "Stay at home, uh, save lives, protect the NHS." That's right. Three word slogans. So, yeah, he was there telling everyone that they had to stay at home because of COVID. The rules included the fact that you couldn't mix with another household indoors. All the the shops and and restaurants were closed. The main thing was that uh, if you wanted to visit a relative in a care home or even a hospital or, or whatever, you couldn't. So we had these situations where... People couldn't visit their aging relatives. Uh, there were horrible pictures of people, you know, at the window saying, I can't come in. And, uh, you know, the old person inside in tears, why can't you come in? Uh, people couldn't go to funerals. Uh, they couldn't, you know, have yeah. their weddings. All this stuff was going on. And Boris Johnson was doing these pompous statements about how you must follow the rules. And then it, it gradually emerged that in Downing Street, they were breaking the rules big time. There was a, a culture of having Friday afternoon drinks and and they all got round and had these, these drunken parties. On one occasion, a senior civil servant invited everybody round and said, bring your own booze. Another occasion, they sent out to a, to a shop to get a suitcase full of bottles for these parties. It emerged really when someone leaked a bit of video. The video was the press office which had a little TV studio, and they were rehearsing how to explain away the parties if ever this got out. And and uh, <laughs> Do- Boris Johnson's media spokesperson, a woman called Allegra Stratton, was seen on, on video laughing and holding her head in her hands saying, maybe it was a work event, <laughs> and things like that. So uh, this this was so outraged everybody, you know, one rule for them, another rule for us, and the fact that they were um, there was this alcohol fueled party culture going on in Downing Street, and they called it Party Gate because gate is always added on to these scandals because of the, the Watergate scandal back in the Washington in the day. Mm. And um, it, more and more revealed, the police were, call, were called in to investigate whether it was breaking the law because these were laws. You know, you know, don't mix with your own and the household. Yeah, yeah. Blah blah. Crimes. If you broke the law, it was a crime. And it took ages for the police to finally come up with 120 fines for people who'd broken the rules. One of them on Boris Johnson. So he he is technically he broke the law. Yeah. Another one for the Chancellor of the Exchequer, Rishi Sunak. Uh, he'd been one of these events, and. Boris Johnson has just tried to brush it off. It hasn't worked. And so he was already on this slippery slope because of that when the last straw, which came recently, uh, and that was another Conservative MP uh, who is called uh, Chris Pincher. 
which is quite an apt name because to pinch it, it is apt. To pinch if you pinch someone it's like you 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 squeeze part that you take part of their body uh, between your thumb and your forefinger and you squeeze it like that like Sorry, to pinch yes, someone pinch. pinch someone's yeah to pinch pinch someone's bottom for example he yeah. had been promoted by Boris Johnson to a quite a senior position. It's uh, the deputy chief whip. Oh, don't ask me. Deputy why it's chief that. whip is someone in a chief very. Whip. It's a very powerful position in the in the concert, in the party, basically. Um, it's it's the the this is the department that looks after party discipline and party behaviour. Makes sure they vote in the right way when the votes come, and they keep people in line, and they also make sure they keep an eye on people's behaviour. So Chris Pincher had been given the job of deputy uh, chief whip is that right that's right yeah okay and then um then he was uh, he was seen drunkenly very drunk he was groping two two young men uh in a in a club with a lot of other MPs there. Groping. We need to... Groping, uh, sexually assaulting, grabbing them. With the hands, um, touching, grabbing, possibly yeah. pinching in a, in an inappropriate <laughs> way. It, um, it's considered to be a form of sexual abuse. Indeed. And then one or two other people came forward, particularly young men who worked in the government, saying that he'd, he'd done the same to them, grabbed them by their inner thigh, grabbed their bottoms, one thing or another. It turned out that he, he was known for this. They called him Pinch by name, Pinch by nature. And that um, Boris Johnson said, I had no idea. I had no idea about this. At this point, another senior civil servant goes on the record saying, I personally told him not to appoint this man because of his reputation as being someone who assaulted young men. Right. Boris Johnson then claimed he f couldn't remember that. You know, I mean, it's not the kind of thing you'd forget Right. So, um, so that was the last straw. People said, this is starting to get ridiculous. We have a prime minister who has no morals, who lies. He just lies and lies and lies. Yeah. And it's the same with anything that, that he, he was campaigning, saying we're going to build 40 new hospitals. Well, everyone knew that wasn't going to be possible. It would break the bank for a start, but um, no sign of them. He just says, says things. Yeah. He went to Northern Ireland and talked to the unionist businessmen there and said there will be no checks between the mainland and Northern Ireland, not while I'm prime minister. If you get a bit of paper you have to fill in, send it to me and I'll put it in the bin. And not long after that, that Thomas was completely broken and we had, a, we had checks between the mainland Britain and Northern Ireland because Northern Ireland was saying remaining in the single market. So checks meaning that any goods that were transported between the two countries would be checked. For example, veterinary checks on meat or animals, you yeah. know, all those things. Mm -hmm. Within the EU internal market, there are no checks at all. Everything just yeah. zooms around. Yeah. Yeah. The moment we're out of it, you have the problem with the Republic of Ireland. Republic of Ireland has a border with Northern Ireland. And the Good Friday Agreement, which has kept peace in, in Northern Ireland for so many years now, said there will never be a border there anymore because that would immediately attract IRA attacks or something. Yeah. So with no border there, they have a problem. And Boris said, well, there won't be a border between Northern Ireland and, and mainland Britain, but there is. Yeah, I mean, how can you promise that? I mean, it's well, well, it's just one of the many, many things that he said that – Probably were never going to be true, but he says things that he thinks are popular. He also had a plan to build a bridge between main, mainland Britain and Northern Ireland, right? And I mean, the plan was that it would it would go from Scotland to Northern Ireland. Is that right? A yes, bridge, that's right? And it, 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 I mean, of course, the plan was never actually carried out. The the idea was cancelled, but it apparently cost a million pounds anyway. It already had cost a million pounds when it was cancelled. It just um, it, it it does have a habit of of launching uh, bold ideas that cost us money and were never going to happen. Like he was going to build a new airport in 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 the Thames Estuary, that was never going to happen. There are countless examples. When he was the mayor of London, he decided to have a new bridge across the Thames, which would be a green bridge. It yeah. would be a pedestrian bridge and it would be a garden bridge. 
and everything else. And they investigated this feasibility. It was going to cost an absolute fortune. The people of London didn't want to waste all their money on another bridge over the Thames. And in the end, it was abandoned after spending a lot of money. It's the same with, with our pandemic test and trace program. He, he said, we need to know everybody who's got it. We need to have a system where everybody uh, has got to, you know, click on their mobile phones. And if you're in any, any contact with somebody or close contact with somebody who's got it, you have to respond and uh, isolate yourself and all that kind of talking stuff. Talking about COVID there. We are. We're yeah. talking about COVID, the pandemic. And yeah. the, the test and trace program never worked. And in the end, it was abandoned, and it had cost somewhere in the region of thirty-eight thousand million pounds. Thirty-eight thousand, what? Thirty-eight billion. Thirty-eight, 38 billion. billion? It, that's mm. that's how much test and trace cost. That's and the, what and a, it, a Commons investigation came up with. It didn't work. Uh, it's just uh, it's such a huge amount of money. It's unbelievable, and 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 yet you know the Johnson regime either denies it or they say it was it worked. And it was very valuable to save lives or whatever, whatever. But the independent assessments have a different view. They think it didn't work properly and it wasted an awful lot of money. Yeah. And meanwhile, um, the death toll from COVID in the UK was, you know, one of the highest. I mean, it's, it's hard to explain this. Highest uh, per think, capita. Yes, per capita. I think it's the highest within the EU uh, or the G7. I can't remember. 200,000 is the official count. Uh, at the moment, uh, it wasn't helped by a decision by the Johnson government to free up beds in hospitals as they were kind of worrying that the hospitals would be overwhelmed with COVID patients. And the, the brilliant idea was to move people who could be put into care homes. We'll, we'll eject them from the hospital beds and put them in care homes. The problem was they didn't test them for COVID. Uh, they said they would. They said they, would, they wouldn't remove anybody without uh, them being tested, okay. but they didn't. And what happened was there was an epidemic of deaths in care homes imported from people coming in from hospital who'd got it. Care homes are where people who are very old or people who are sick and need to be looked after all the time, they stay in care homes. Instead of staying in, staying in hospitals all the time, they stay in care homes, which are like homes where there are nurses and doctors and so on. So uh, vulnerable, very vulnerable people live in these care homes so basically the the solution to overcrowding in hospitals was move a lot of patients into care homes but they didn't test them for covid yeah, so of course right. all the people in the care homes all got covid and it caused deaths and i'm i'm, I'm sorry to be so negative about my government but i can't help it uh, and people might be saying how come they've thrown out boris johnson who was you know such an interesting character and he claims to have you know been the most the strongest supporter of Ukraine. He claims that, you know, everything's going fine. And I'm just trying to explain that everything is not going fine. And, and the main problem with Boris Johnson was dishonesty. Obviously, democracy is, isn't perfect. And um, was it Churchill says it's the least worst system? Mm -hmm. um, and of course, it isn't perfect. And, and many of the things that have been happening here in recent years are testament to that. You know, the fact that uh, more than half of the people who voted in the referendum could believe that leaving the EU was a good idea uh, is a is a you know a testament to the fact that if you campaign in a certain way and if you've got the press on your side, uh, you know the written press, the newspapers, then you can vote for nearly anything. So um, it's one of the reasons that Boris Johnson was prime minister is that he was populist. He would say things people wanted to hear, and he'd do it amusingly. Yeah, and the media are part of it too, because um, especially the newspapers, as you said, I think uh, right-wing newspapers, and most of the newspapers are right-wing, and they essentially uh, support this. this they, they support the Tory party. They're all part of the same kind of establishment system. So they're all sort of hand-in-glove uh, with each other. Yes, we, we have um, some really extraordinary newspapers. The biggest selling newspaper, the Daily Mail, own, owned by Lord Rothermere, is very anti-Europe, very nationalistic. And um, it's, it's extraordinary how it, it is campaigning for hard right policies and 
they're in love with Boris Johnson. The Express is even worse, but that's not really a newspaper; it's a comic. And the uh, and the Times is getting better. Telegraph is very pro pro Johnson. Uh, the Sun, of course, owned by Rupert Murdoch, uh, is a right wing paper. But it's very interesting to watch the Sun at the moment because Murdoch's got a record of backing winners, and if uh, and he hasn't been. You know, the sun hasn't been as a vociferous for, for Bron- Johnson as you might think. If basically it's like the Conservative Party, if Johnson is going to allow them all to stay in power, then they will support him. And the moment that the tables turn, when the tipping point happens, you know, when you get to that tipping point and he's no longer the asset that he once was, then, yeah, they'll turn against him, which is what happened. So all of those res- resignations of MPs, this was... Um, this was basically the Conservative Party saying, right, isn't enough is enough. This is the last straw. And it's interesting that uh, members of Parliament show their dissatisfaction or express themselves by resigning. That's from just, resigning from their posts, they from resign, their ministerial posts, of, you know, not resigning as MPs. Uh, but now, of course, there'll be right. a new prime minister and he will pick a new cabinet. So uh, there will be a number of the people who've been in Boris Johnson's cabinet who will no doubt be shown the door. Um, and, you yeah. know, we could name a few names. Rhys Mogg. Can't yes. stand him. Can't stand him. He's like some sort of Victorian nightmare. <laughs> yes. Shall I tell you who, who as we speak... Uh, has got most MP support so far. Yeah, who are the who are the sort of um, top picks? Well, the Chancellor Exchequer claims he's got more MPs supporting his bid than anybody else. That's Rishi Sunak, ex Chancellor of the Exchequer, because he ex Chancellor of the Exchequer. That's right. He resigned, and uh, Boris Johnson uh, quite swiftly appointed a, a guy called Nadim Zahawi as the Chancellor, <laughs> who, who like almost a day later resigned as well. <laughs> yes, uh, that's right. But so he's, uh, he's now uh, in the uh, in the running. He's a candidate, right? But Rishi Sunak is one of the sort of uh, hot picks. Who knows? Because I think it's wide open, and you can't second guess the Conservative MPs and the Conservative members in the country. Remember, listeners, the, the people who are going to vote for this are not members of the public, not all of them. First of all, it's members of Parliament, uh, so Conservative uh, MPs in the House of Commons who will f- do the first round of voting, and then when it's down to the final two, it'll be all members of the Conservative Party. That's just voters who uh, love the, t- the Conservatives, and they have become members. They're not politicians; they're just uh, ordinary uh, citizens. So it'll be Conservative Party members who will make the final decision, and we never know what they're going <laughs> to what they're going to do. No, we don't. So at, at the moment, the former Chancellor of the Exchequer, Rishi Sunak. Uh, is thought to be one of the more likely. The former Foreign Secretary, Liz Truss, is also spoken of. The f- former Health Secretary, uh, Sajid Javid, is thought to be one of those who might make it. When asked about this a few months ago, when people could see it coming, I said, watch out for Penny Mordant. Penny Mordant probably won't make it, but uh, the reason I said that was that you might finish up with someone who's who's not disliked by enough people. So, so instead of everybody saying, this is obviously the right candidate, this is the person, this is the leader, this is the person we want, it's all a bit of a mess. And, and you might finish up with somebody who is a compromise, if you like, somebody who is, well, she's not too bad. And, uh, yeah. you know... Uh, she hasn't has not been tainted by scandal like some of them have. Someone that people don't absolutely hate. And you might say, which one of these can win an election? Which one of these will will be acceptable? Which one is the one that will stand out from the crowd? Which is the one who would beat Sir, Sir Keir Starmer, the Labour leader? And Penny Mordaunt might fit that pattern. In that she's, you know, nice looking woman. Uh, she's been a defence minister. She's been in another ministry. And uh, as I say, she hasn't been controversial. Yeah. So um, so you never know. It may, may be somebody we don't expect like that might turn out to be our next prime minister. We'll see, eh, Luke? We will see. We will see indeed. Okay, but I mean, Boris, as again, I'll say again, he hasn't actually resigned. He just said that he will resign. 
Yes, you can look up his speech, you know, the speech he made in front of Number 10 Downing Street, and you'll see that he didn't use the word resign. But obviously, you know, he has. The reality is that the Tories will choose another leader and he will then have to pack his bags and maybe he'll take his expensive wallpaper with him. Because one one of the other issues I didn't think worth mentioning before was that he and his wife, Carrie, had the Downing Street flat redecorated. Now, there is actually an allocation of £30,000 for redecoration, um, which is, you know, it's in the rules. He uh, he spent £150,000 on the most garish furniture and gold wallpaper at £80 a roll. I mean, we've seen pictures of it. It's horrible. It's just like, you know, a dictator palace situation. Uh, and w- when people said, How ca- where's this £150,000 come from? Uh, apparently, it was a-, a regular Tory donor, a very, very wealthy man uh, who was in the House of Lords. Who, who paid for this refurbishment. But when asked about who paid for it, Boris Johnson said he couldn't remember. Uh, I mean, it's just a catalogue of things. So uh, we'll believe he's gone, Luke, when we see the furniture van outside number 10. The only thing that people ever say about uh, Boris and like the, one of the big arguments they used to defend him is that what about the vaccine rollout that they got yeah. the vaccine out before uh, the rest of Europe did and I mean is that what I've heard is that that wasn't that Boris and the Tories were uh, the ones who led that initiative it's that Oxford University were the ones who did all the legwork the, the hard work and they managed to uh, come up with a vaccine and, and uh, you know uh, administer it despite the Tories, not because of the Tories. I think it's true that we got vaccinating pretty quickly. Mm. And Boris Johnson will, of course, take personal credit for that. But um, you're right. It was uh, uh, the people at, in uh, working on the AstraZeneca contract at Oxford University who'd got the vaccine and, and pushed for mass production of it. And it had to get approval. But they basically took the line, let's get mass producing it now before it's got approval because we think it will be approved and why wait so it's a gamble and it meant meant that that we could start vaccinating probably a little bit quicker than most other european countries it's a fact but uh the you know to say we we led the vaccination program as a political act i think is um a bit simplistic bit of a gamble though wasn't it it's like let's mass produce this vaccine before we've even finished um working on it they didn't think it was a gamble and and the worst that could have happened is that they would have failed to get it approved and then they would have wasted money on on that vaccine they would have dumped it but the advantage in lives saved was was um and it proved to be right that they were yeah. confident that it would be good and it was okay well, there we are. Thank you, Luke. <laughs> we we live in interesting times here, and uh, we'll we'll uh, we'll wait for the return of Boris Johnson in a few years' time. Yeah. Oh God, that's going to be well. At least it'll give us something to talk about. But it we, will. you know, we've got plenty of other things to talk about too. I'd much I much rather talk about you know other things. I have to say. I mean, I think listeners enjoy and appreciate being able to hear uh, these things being explained like this and talked about. But it's 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 thoroughly depressing and disappointing that we've got such scumbags running the country. Well, I think it's just a temporary blip. That it's all about Brexit and and that a right-wing nationalist group have been in power on the back of of that referendum result. And I I hope that whoever becomes the next Prime Minister will have the strength to keep that group of uh, hardline nationalists at bay. There's little sign of it in the campaign so far. Everybody is talking about, I will cut taxes which means you cut public services, they're still playing to the party faithful who, you know, believe in small government, less intervention, a small (laughs) state. They also believe in screwing over the poor and just giving all the advantages to the rich. The the figures are not good about the gap between rich and poor continuing to widen the number of kids in Official poverty increasing, number of people using food banks increasing. The OECD says that we'll have the lowest growth 
growth of any Western country next year, zero, probably a recession. I mean, there, there is not a lot of good news about at the moment. Meanwhile, all the richest people continue to get richer and richer. Uh, meanwhile, all, you know, all the ordinary people just experience zero wage growth and so on like that. This is the modus operandi of the Conservative Party. Well, we've, we've still got a little bit of this summer to go. Uh, I mean, it's France where you live, where people take to the streets at a moment's notice. But we've um, we've we're going into a period which could see strikes. Uh, we've already had a, a strike from the railway workers, which has shut down the, the trains for five days. And if they don't get a deal, they'll they'll be back. But there are now ballots going on amongst members, amongst teachers, some of the NHS health service staff. A number of people are saying we've got inflation heading for eleven percent, and people are giving us a pay rise of two percent, and we're not having it. So I think that uh, you know autumn of of strikes is what might face the incoming prime minister. So it'll be an interesting time. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, thank you for talking to us about it, Dad. Okay. Actually, uh, I've got another episode with you already recorded. We recorded it, uh, when was it, last month? And uh, that's on your shelf. That's that's sort of in the pipeline and uh, will be published uh, uh, soon. Uh, completely but- different. Completely, completely different. Completely different. Yeah. So we, um, yeah, we recorded that a while ago. So that's coming soon, and it's nothing to do with politics. It's something else completely, which is nice. Thanks again, Dad. And we'll see you soon. See you uh, in a few days. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank bye you. Bye for now. Then. Bye bye. Bye bye. So what remains to be said at the end of this episode here? Not that much, really. Um, I should say thank you to my dad for his contribution to this episode. Thank you. Um, It was mostly him. I couldn't get a word in, which is fine. My dad was on a roll and uh, had plenty of things to say. This is wonderful. We're very lucky to uh, be able to have his contributions to this podcast from time to time. I know that listeners out there that you enjoy these episodes and you appreciate them. Uh, As I always say, I look forward to reading your comments wherever you leave them. Um, I'm just curious to know what you think. Um, That's pretty much it. It's late as I'm recording this. I need to go to bed. It's hot. It's boiling hot. we've, We've hit the peak of the heat wave, I think, although I think it's going to continue. Uh, so it's very hot, and I don't like the hot conditions. Um, no, I'm not designed for these conditions. I struggle. Um, so there you go. What else? Yeah, I'll repeat what I said at the beginning. If you're a Libsyn premium subscriber, just hold on, okay? Hold your horses, basically. That's an expression in English that just means wait. Hold your horses. So if please hold your horses before you request a refund from Libsyn. Okay, we just need a little bit of time just to sort out a few things. I will come back to you as soon as possible with specific instructions on what to do if you want to cancel your Libsyn and uh, sign up with ACAST+. Plus. Just, you're just going to have to wait, I'm afraid. I'm trying to make this period as short as possible. I don't want to extend this limbo that that LEP Premium is currently in. Um, For those of you, as I said at the beginning, who are brand new to Luke's English Podcast Premium, if you didn't have an account before with the old system, if you're just going to start fresh with ACAST Plus, then go right ahead. Please be my guest. It's all available there. Just go to teacherluke.co.uk slash premium to get started and choose the LEP Premium option. You'll get two options. One is just to get ad-free episodes of the podcast. And the other one is to get ad-free episodes plus all the premium content. So go for that one. Obviously, that's the that's the best one to go for. Um, I'll let you discover it at your leisure. Send me an email if you want. Visit my website for more information. Okay, I've got more episodes in the pipeline, but I just don't have any time to actually work on them or upload them, edit them, and, you know sort of uh, get them ready and publish them to you 
This episode that you've just listened to was unplanned. I didn't expect to do this, but I just thought that we needed to talk about it. We needed to talk about what was going on with Boris Johnson, that surely people around the world had noticed that Boris had basically resigned and that, you know, it was like, right, it's time for a Rick Thompson report. Emergency Rick Thompson report situation. And uh, so luckily my dad was free. I had a little bit of free time yesterday between English lessons. And then I was able to come and uh, I was able to do it and put it together and send it to you like this. But I've got other stuff in the pipeline. I've got another one with my dad, which is about something completely different, uh, about some uh, myths and legends. Um, the, the Arthurian legends, a story from... Um, from the Arthurian legends, King Arthur and the Knights of the Round Table, a poem written um, about um, one of the knights of the round table and an adventure that he goes on. Uh, So a bit of kind of middle English and poetry. It's it's great, great stuff, adventure story and everything. That's uh, that's an episode with my dad. I've got some stuff about Paul McCartney coming because it was his 80th birthday recently. All stuff I recorded last month when I had time, and I recorded a bunch of things, and then it's then I haven't been able to work on them because I'm teaching uh, courses at the British Council in July this month. Um, every July, essentially, it's a really busy month at the at the British Council where they put on these intensive summer courses before everyone goes on holiday in August. A lot of people um, choose to take intensive English courses, which means that I'm teaching all day, every day, a full-time schedule. Uh, So that's the reason. Um, And then in August, we're going on holiday. So I don't know how I'm going to do this, but I'll find a way. I've I've got about five days at the end of July where I'm not teaching, and I'll just throw myself into the podcast and just try and get all of the the episodes I've recorded sort of prepared, edited and ready to be uh, published um, over the the next few weeks. And then when I'm back from holiday, I'll be able to carry on. So I've got some stuff about Paul McCartney uh, because he turned 80 this year. So it was about, it's a long overdue episode about, uh, about Paul and, and why we love him so much. And what else? I've got other things. I've got an episode with my friend Sarah Donnelly, who is uh, uh, my one of my American friends. She is a stand-up comedian. She's also an English teacher. And so we did an episode recently together about American and British English. You know, the good old, good old subject, American and British English differences. And it was fun because we had fun doing some quizzes and things like that. I've done that a few times before, but it's always a good thing to deal with on the podcast, sort of comparing and contrasting the different versions of English and um, having a bit of fun while doing it. Uh, What else have I got in the, what else have I got? Hold on. Let me just check my, let me just check my document here on my computer. Um, Because, you know, I can't just, um, I can't just rely on my memory. I've got P35 part two, the pronunciation drills for that story about the bear. So that's the next premium episode, which is like primed and ready. It's got to be, it'll be published as soon as all this mess has been sorted out. So I've got P35 part two, the pronunciation drills, which will only be a premium lesson. I've got the one with my dad I mentioned. I've got McCartney stuff. I've got British and American English with Sarah. And also I've got uh, something about uh, going to the pub with Charlie Baxter from the British English podcast. Uh, We did one where we kind of imagined that we were going to a pub together and we ordered drinks and sort of talk about going to the pub and some of the language that you can use in that situation. That's a fun episode. Um, so there you go. Thank you so much for listening to this podcast. Uh, I hope that you are having a nice life. Hope your life is going all right. If you are, I don't know, if you're in Ukraine, then you have our support. It's a terrible, terrible nightmare what is happening. I'll say no more than that. Obviously, some of you are desperate for me to talk about it more. But just suffice to say that um, I think it's horrendous. It depresses me deeply. It makes me very angry. Um, 
I mean, just talking about it is going to trigger some people because they're going to decide that I don't know what I'm talking about. Um, but I think it's a horrible situation and um, I just wish it would stop and the the lies and the misinformation is thoroughly, thoroughly depressing on a very, very big scale. It's a horrible situation. Um, and, you know, I just want, I want peace in Lapland. That sounds kind of glib, you know, to talk about Lapland. I mean, I want peace in the real world. I want peace on earth. It sounds... Uh, um, what's the word naive or something but why should it be naive why 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 is it necessary for us to blow up our neighbors oh this got heavy didn't it this got heavy quickly time to go to bed listeners peace and love okay peace and love in lapland take care be excellent to each other okay and i will speak to you soon but for now, it's time to say goodbye. Bye, 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 bye. Thanks for listening to Luke's English Podcast. For more information, visit teacherluke.co.uk.